Since vain, vain, desert side, ere I wish there under there yet We call them the Amish. Shunning modern advancements, they drive horses and buggies and live without electricity. Where do they come from? Are they a culture? A religion? What made them who they are? This film series explores the inner workings of the Amish church, as told by some of their own, who no longer wear black hats and bonnets. For 300 years, the Amish have been known as the silent in the land, now a growing number of them are breaking the silence. It's a quarter till nine on a Sunday morning, and the Old Order Amish in the local community are gathering for their church services. As the families arrive, the men form a familiar semicircle out by the barn, and the ladies leave their bonnets, cloaks, and shawls in the summer kitchen and move into the house where the benches are already set out. The usual lively chatter is somewhat subdued in honor of the occasion. Outside, the men unhitch the horses and put them in the barn. They speak to each other in low tones, mostly about the weather, the harvest, and other events of the past several weeks. Recently, one of the families in the next community over lost their house to a house fire. As each man finishes putting his horse up in the barn and joins the other men outside, he shakes each of their hands and they greet one another with a holy kiss on the cheek. The younger boys stand with their fathers. The older boys and single young men wait in a separate location. This is just one example of the accepted way of doing things that every young Amish person quickly learns. These traditions have been handed down generation after generation and give the Amish their distinctives, such as clothing that help them stay separated from the world around them. The Amish are well known for working together to provide the things they need. Church is no exception. The families take turns hosting church services in their homes. The ladies come together and help clean the house of whoever is hosting. The men of the place clean up the barn and outside areas in preparation for the big day. The Old Order Amish only meet for church services every other Sunday, unless there is a visiting minister. Then they will make special services for him. On the in-between Sundays, they gather in the afternoons in each other's homes for food and fellowship. In the United States, there are Amish communities in 31 states. There are certain characteristics they all share, but to the practiced eye of an Amish person, their clothing looks very different from community to community. Because the Amish make all their own clothes to community-specific guidelines, a visitor can be quickly spotted by the difference in the cut of the clothes or the style of the men's hat or the lady's cap and bonnet. When it is time, the bishop or lead minister starts toward the house. The other ministers follow him in the order in which they were ordained. The deacon always walks last. On their way in, they shake the hand of all the single young ladies who are waiting for the right time to go inside. Removing their hats, the ministers enter the house where they shake hands with all the ladies who are already seated and waiting. Inside the house, the subdued conversation ceases once the ministers enter. A somber silence prevails, accented by the sound of people finding their seats and shifting on the wooden benches. In many communities, the wooden benches are owned by the families, each family making sure there is enough seating for themselves and a few visitors. Often, the benches are stored in a bench wagon that moves from house to house with the church services.
The rest of the men enter the house in order of their age, the oldest to the youngest. The young boys sit with their fathers. The Amish have used the same Ausbund hymnal for hundreds of years. Each family contributes enough hymnals to the church for their family and one or two extra. As the men are entering, the deacon hands out the hymnals in preparation for the service. After the men and boys are seated, it is time for the single young people to file in and find their seats. At a word from the bishop or lead minister, the song leader gives out the hymn number and the church service begins as they all join in a slow Gregorian chant of an old German hymn. This was my childhood. Sunday morning at church, I'd be in there. I'd be singing those songs. My dad would be getting ready to preach. So many good memories all wrapped up in this. My name is Joseph Graber. I'm the director and host for this film series. I grew up Amish. My father was an old order Amish minister and for the first 14 years of my life, I wore the plain clothes, we went everywhere in horses and buggies, all of that. In a little bit, I'm gonna take you and show you some more of the Amish church service, but first, I want you to meet my parents. I remember those mornings standing out in front of the barn with the other men waiting for church. You know, I had my big hat on, my hat that had a wider rim than everybody else because I'm a minister. I love the Amish ways. When the Amish have church at their house, then the neighborhood ladies come together and help them clean their house. And while the ladies are cleaning, the children play. And we had so much fun playing. And I mean, the whole house was clean from top to bottom. Everything was cleaned and gone through and the dishes were scarred and everything was gotten ready for the great day of church. And that was so special when church was at your house. As you drive through Amish country, you will see horses and buggies, black hats and bonnets, and you may even see the community coming together for an Amish barn raising. Right now there are 290,000 Amish people. They double in size every 20 years. And they say by 2050, there will be a million Amish in America. Most families, particularly the conservative groups, it's not uncommon for them to have 10 or 15, or in some cases, more than 20 children. I grew up in a family of 10. My mother grew up in a family of 15. My dad grew up in a family of 13. So when my husband and I married, we only had seven. So that was downsizing, that's what we always thought. People on the outside are intrigued by their large families and the way they seem to live closer to the land, gardening and farming and living without electricity. How have the Amish maintained this lifestyle over so many generations? And how has this culture remained untouched by all the modern inventions around it? What holds the Amish together? The answer to this question cannot be easily seen from the roadside as one drives by. In fact, for centuries, this secret has been hidden within the Amish church service, where those on the outside are seldom allowed to go. But come with me, discover the secret as I take you through an Amish church service and a traditional Sunday at the Borntrager farm. The church service is in progress and they're just coming to the end of the second song of the morning. 
The Amish use three languages. At home, they speak a dialect of Low German called Pennsylvania Dutch. At school, they learn English to be used in their interactions with the outside world. But in church, all of their songs, scriptures, and church writings are written in an old High German that they have been handing down for 300 years. The German they use in church is their least used language, and many of them struggle to understand it. Right now, they're singing the Loblied. It's page 770 in the old Ausbund hymnal. And they've used this hymnal for hundreds of years, and for almost the same amount of time, they have always sung this song as the second song of every church service. During the first song of the church service, the ministers will leave and go to Aprot, a place apart where they can take counsel for the day. It is during this time that they decide who is preaching that day and in what order they'll preach. After they've made these decisions, they will have a time of silent prayer and then they will rejoin the congregation, usually toward the end of the Loblied. Once the Loblied is finished, the first minister will stand up and he will preach the Afang. The Afang is the beginning message. Supposed to be limited to 15 minutes. That's what the rules said. He's supposed to just speak from his heart. The ministers, when they're preaching, are not allowed to actually read from the Bible. They're just supposed to preach from memory. At the end of his 15-minute message, he will then kneel with the congregation and lead them in a prayer that he will read from the Christian's prayer book. After the prayer, they will all rise and the deacon, or the second minister, will then read the first scripture of the day. There's a certain scriptures every Sunday that you read. Every year on this Sunday you read this scripture. Next year on that same Sunday you read the same scripture. Then he would sit down. Then the third preacher, they always had three parts in the Amish church. The third preacher, he would get up. He will preach what is called the Maradale, or the main message of the day. And then your main sermon would last for about 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a quarter. It would depend. One of my favorite memories of the Amish church service would happen whenever the main minister got up to preach. The lady of the house would pass around some snickerdoodles or Amish sugar cookies for all the younger children to have a snack. As an Amish preacher, I learned to preach without a microphone and uh, I was conscious of the fact that sometimes we had large houses, large groups, or in a shed or a barn where it was a long way. At the end of his message, he will then pick up the Bible and he will read the second scripture of the day. Then he would sit down and ask for at least three other men's testimonies regarding what he said. Did me say I didn't finally. I don't admit the water will so so to um don't get down here and the nearest friendly can send a giddy very evidently. Work on all the wood toilets here and also and all send a living here very prize. The wood generally send a good husband. Remember on right tune and 
Ich kann dir so alles ich kann verstanden habe, dann die kann ich bekennen. Wir gehen auch gut das Wort zu sehen. Dann sehe ich eh nicht mäßig. Und ich berichte. Then he will lead in one more prayer. Everyone will kneel, and again he'll be reading the prayer from the Christian's prayer book. Oh, do need to hear from hand to hear God. Leave him to your father. Dare to understand and all kindred. Danny Gideon, friendly, carry the fleece your side to be vassalized. Und uns nicht allein diese Lust, Teufel und Genicktes Gemüt gegeben hast. Unser Vater in den Himmel, dein Name wird gehandelt, dein Reich, komm mit ein Wille geschehen, auch werde wie in den Himmel. <coughs> unser täglich Brot, gib uns heute, vergib uns unsere Schuld. Wie wir unsere Schulden vergeben, für uns nicht zu versuchen. Sondern er lese uns von den Ebel, denn dein ist das Reich, die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit, bis in Ewigkeit. Amen. Once the prayer is finished, they will rise to their feet and the minister will lead them in a benediction. To that shlevy breeder, fraud I, side fall come and trash that I hopped on my sin, side freedom, so we are good, dear living as freedom's made I sign. To me and the beschluss befailing me, made I hung good, sign word of the naughty hand on, does here will do and send them sailing, man and glove and stergen, drinning a hundred lot and fearing, piss them sailing and end it. And after the benediction, there will be an announcement about where church will be the following Sunday. And then the song leader gives out the final song, and they sing one more song. Once the last song is finished and church is over, the children will all go outside to play. The men will take down the benches and set them up as tables, and the women will start getting the food ready and putting it on the tables. And within 15 minutes, you can be feeding a bunch of people your typical Amish Sunday dinner. I have some very fond memories as a boy, sitting there and waiting for my father or one of the other lead ministers to make the announcements that, that it's time to eat. When the dish falls in, we will still have it some When the dish falls in, we will still have it some Once the lead minister shuffled his feet or cleared his throat, we knew the silent prayer was over and we could start eating. Every Sunday we had peanut butter and jelly and there might be pickled beets and pickles and all sorts of other things, but the main meal for most of my growing up years at the Amish church service was peanut butter and jelly. And it wasn't just any kind of peanut butter. We used peanut butter that had been mixed with maybe corn syrup and marshmallow cream, so it was a deluxe spread. In the afternoon, everything slows down. Men will sit around and chat for a while. The ladies will clean up the food and the children will be playing outside. Then one by one, families will hitch up their horses and leave to go home to take care of their chores and their animals. One or two of the families may decide to stay over for the young people singing that night. And in the evening, the young people get together, they sit at this long table, then they have all have these little books, and then we sing German. And in the church services, the women never leave, but in the evenings, the, the girls are allowed to leave. So the girl can pick a song, 
and say the number. Today, hold on, sex and arty, and then they leave. And and the way the Amish would sing is, you said the first, the person who s s gave out the song would always say the first word of every line. And so everybody, you would sing a line, everybody would pause. You would sing the first word, then everybody joined in, sing the line, then everybody would pause and again. The Amish young people singing is the official place where Amish romances start. During the singing, the boys will sit on one side of the table and the girls will sit on the other side of the table. And so there is naturally a jockeying for position to be closest to the one that you're trying to attract at that time. Growing up Amish and then going to the young folks singing a Sunday night, we thought the big thing was always afterwards, you know, we'd talk about the girls and see who was taking who home. And the young men will either ask a girl or send someone to ask the girl if they can take them home that night. If the couple is already going steady, then the young man will just go harness his horse and get ready and then he'll come and pick up the girl. And together they will head off for the traditional Amish date. The young man will take the girl to her house where they will both go inside and spend some time talking, possibly eating a snack. And then later in the evening, the young boy will go back to his home. And so another Amish Sunday comes to a close. There's a busy week ahead. There is so much beauty in the Amish culture. And for those of us who were privileged to grow up in it, we have many fond childhood memories. As a child, everything seemed right with the world as long as all the grown-ups were sitting in there and singing the songs. The preachers were getting up to preach. Everything seemed right, safe, and secure. As you get older, you realize that uniformity is not unity. I didn't know that underneath those sort of studied faces, there was a lot of turmoil going on. Growing up, there were issues that I struggled with. Is here I was born and raised for the first six years of my life in Middlebury, Indiana, a very, you know, much more liberal community than we ever lived in after that. Then we moved to Clark, Missouri, which was quite a conservative community, still is today. We moved from Clark, Missouri to Brunson, Michigan when I was 15 years old, and four years later, we actually moved to, back to LaGrange, Indiana, where Dad kind of made us full circle and came back to Indiana. What it presented to me was the fact that there were so many different kinds of Amish. In one community, we'd say chainsaws are worldly, but the next community, they were fine, we used them. One community, uh, gas lights were worldly, but the next community, Everybody used them. One community, they washed clothes by hand because they wouldn't have a Briggs and Stratton or, or some kind of engine to, to run their washing machine because it was worldly. Some places it was against the rules to have more than six mama sows, you know, if you raise hogs or, you know, you shouldn't milk more than 12 cows. The next community down the road or the next community in the next state or whatever, any other community, they could do, they might have a total different set of rules, you know. There were some things that we all had in common, like horses and buggies. When I was 15, we moved to Toma, Wisconsin. And that is where my Amish world started shaking to pieces. Up till then, I loved being Amish. I thought Amish was the only way. I was a very loyal Amish person. Whenever we moved, we would have to sell some of our livestock. But when we were going to move to Toma, Wisconsin, my dad said he's going to sell all the ponies ever since I could remember growing up. But we always had at least one pony and most of the time two and three ponies that we children could ride. Part of my life was leaving. I said, why? And he said, it's against the rules of the church there. And I thought, against the rules of the church? He said, well, it's too much like just for pleasure. I said, okay. He said, in some places they have bicycles and ponies are just the next thing to bicycles. And bicycles are definitely worldly. We can see that. So if we see the connection there, then we should know that, yeah, ponies could be bad for the Amish. Okay, so I had to swallow that and leave my, let my ponies go. Trying to understand why some things are all right in one community, but not in another. Why one church does this, another church does that. If I had lived in one community all of my life, you'd have accepted that and never thought much of it. But we did move around and I kept asking my uncle, you know, why do we do certain things? Why do the Amish do this? Where do you get all the, the basis for all the rules that we have? And 
He really didn't have any good answers. It was never, let's go to the Bible and here's the basis of what we do. The answers I kept getting were, well, back in 55, a decision was made by a group of Amish, and that's why we do this this way. In 1955, over a hundred Old Order Amish bishops, ministers, and deacons met in Holmes County, Ohio, for a conference on unity within the Amish. Each of their churches had slightly different rules, and now some churches were becoming more and more modern. How could they know that they could fellowship with a church without somehow being in sin with them? So after three days of deliberation, they came up with the Fimpenfutis Pschluss. Basically, it was an agreement that said that any church that agrees with the ordinance letter from the minister's conference in 1917, Holmes County, that church we can fellowship with especially with Article 11 of that 1917 ordinance letter. The ban and shunning shall be practiced by the ministry and lay members. And so this created a large amount of uniformity among the Old Order Amish Church while leaving a lot of room for creativity and slightly diverse rules because their unity was based on their both agreeing on the letter from 1917. And while bishops and some Amish ministers might know what the Beschluss of 1955 said. Most Amish people didn't really know. So they were agreeing on something that they didn't even know what it was. Because unity and fellowship was enforced by the ban and shunning, it was necessary for every church member to know and promise to keep all the rules. Baptism day is, is the biggest day in your life next to your wedding day. Because baptism day is the day that you are brought into the church. Before you are baptized, you make a vow on your knees, making a promise to the church that as long as you live, you will keep the ordinances, follow the rules and traditions of the forefathers. And this vow will be held against you for the rest of your life, as long as you live, in my community, we got baptized at the age of 17. Before you could be baptized, you had to go through a process of sitting with the ministers every Sunday. And they would explain to you why it was so important for your clothes and your lifestyle and, and everything about you was to be within the guidelines of the church. All the members of the church were to watch you and make sure that nothing would deviate from that ordinance letter. Before they can be baptized, a vote has to be taken among the congregation to make sure that they're keeping all the rules. I was always a stickler. If I knew what the rules were, I did them to a T because I was gonna be a good Amish girl. And I mean, and I love my dad. And I thought if my dad's Amish, then it must be good and it must be right. So I will do it to the best of my ability. But when they took a vote and then they came to tell us, the bishop has told me that something came up against me. I remember I just started shaking. I couldn't believe that. What were they going to tell me? What had I done wrong? What in the world was it? And he said that there's a pin there. You put a pin in the back of your collar in the cape and that should not be there. That shows pride if you put an extra pin there. The other girl that was joining church with me and going to get baptized, her sister told the bishops that I had this pin in there. And I thought, why didn't she tell me instead of going and telling the bishop? I had no clue that that was against the rules. Another thing that happened before I was a church member was one week my mom and dad decided to go on a trip. So I wanted to do something to surprise them when they came home. And I thought, you know, it would be great to have a porch swing because we had a nice front porch. And in the shop, there was a whole bundle of these little slats that looked just like the things I've seen, I'd seen porch swings made of. So, and I knew how to use the skill saw and everything. And, and, and I made the neatest little porch swing. And it was actually strong. My sisters were so surprised. They said, you actually made it. They could sit on, two people could sit side by side and everybody was enjoying this porch swing. So I was anticipating when my dad came home and see what he would say, he would be so delighted. And I was really let down when I saw the look on his face when he walked on the porch. I thought, what did I do wrong? 
did, didn't I make a good job of it? He took me aside and he talked. He said, that's a really good job and we'll put it on the sale and it'll probably bring a really good price for your workmanship. But he said, it's against the rules of the church to have a porch swing. Oh, what is wrong with this community? It seemed like there were more rules than you could shake a stick at. Every way I turned, there was something. Why does it matter that every community has slightly different rules? And why would my mom be so distressed that she had inadvertently broken some of the rules? Here at last, we come to the core of what holds the Amish together. Every spring and fall, there are two church services, Ordnungsgme and Groskme. Groskme is Communion Sunday, and Ordnungsgme is the dreaded council meeting that happens two weeks prior to Communion. In council meeting, you had church like any other church. You would start the same way. The minister who led the main sermon would preach for up to three hours. Then you have the members meeting, and then the bishop, you know, it's his responsibility, he gets back up, and then he'll read the standard. The ordinance brief, or standard, is the letter with all of the rules for that community. As the bishop reads the letter to the congregation, each member has to make sure that they're keeping all of the rules. If they've broken any of the rules, they need to make a confession before the church. If you do a sin against the Amish rules in church, then you need to make a confession in church. The preacher asks just the members to say everybody goes out, and then he tells them what this person wants to confess, and then he asks all the other members, are you willing to forgive this person and let him uh, free of it? And so then they'll take a vote, they'll go along, and everybody has to say, yes, I agree, yes. Or they have a little German thing that they say, ja, ich bin enig mit der Vorschlag. Ja, ich bin enig mit der Vorschlag. Everybody has to say that. Even the women get to speak then, but they have to say what they're supposed to. And a lot of times you could have a council meeting that would last till four or five o'clock in the evening. Depends, you know, long, long church. All of this is done in preparation for Groskme, the communion service that comes two weeks later. Groskme is another epic, all day long church service. The preaching goes on for hours. There is no lunch break but food is prepared in another room and a few people at a time will leave the main service to go over and eat a quick silent meal while the preaching continues in the main part of the house. The communion service itself consists of a round loaf of bread that is cut in a special way and then broken and handed out to each of the members by the bishop. After the bread, the bishop then passes around a shared cup of wine to each member. And at the end of all this comes a time of foot washing. Two men at a time will go to the foot washing station and wash each other's feet, while the ladies are washing their feet at another station. If any of the members does not measure up to the standard, they cannot participate in communion. This is called being put in the band. Sometimes it's the short ban, which lasts for several weeks to give the person time to make things right. But if it is the full ban, then the community will also practice shunning. When a person is being shunned, the members are not supposed to eat with them and they're discouraged from associating with them. The ban and shunning have become the trademark of Amish church discipline. For most Amish, being in good standing with the church is their only hope for salvation. I remember one day in the, one of the chicken houses, a fellow out there asked me, are you really born again or are you just guys just religious? And I'm like, well, how could you even ask that? Of course we're born again, we're Amish. Growing up, what did you learn about how to get to heaven? Uh, the way I understood it was that you would hmm. need to be baptized. And you know, when you made that uh, confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and if you, you know, if that verbally comes out of your mouth, and then also the rules that the church has, and those are to be followed. Mm -hmm. To agree to the rules and obey the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's lots of them, so. And therefore, that, that should get you to heaven. Should, but was it guaranteed? <laughs> no, it was not guaranteed. It was just a wishful or a, a hope. Hoping of going to heaven but not knowing that you can go to heaven. But it's the hope that lives amongst the Amish people and how they believe and what they do 
and how our forefathers did, what our uh, parents did, what our ancestors did. That's the hope that we have to do what they did. It's, it wasn't a living hope. It was basically a false hope. Okay, well. You know, saved in German is selig. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as saved in the Amish eyes, most right. Amish eyes, especially from where I come from. I can't speak for all the Amish, but from especially where I come from, there's no such thing as saved, and there's no such thing as a subject about talking about being saved. Don't even think about it, don't talk about it, and don't even look about it, because it's no such such thing. As a preacher of the Word in the Amish Church, you're not concerned about people getting saved. Were you ever told of a specific way you can go to hell growing up? Yeah. We were told if you leave the traditions that you've been taught, that you're just headed for hell if you happen to die. And the other one was the room spring at the wild stages of life. If you're if you were a kid and you had a car and you had an accident and, and, and died, you were automatically headed to hell. One Sunday morning I just remember coming to church and my great uncle's wife was just weeping and crying and the other ladies would go to her and they would just all be sobbing and weeping and crying and I thought what is wrong? What happened? I didn't know that anybody died. But then one of the young girls said that Marietta ran away. She went to the English. And that was their teenage girl. And it just went through me like a, oh my goodness, how did she dare? And now she's going to go to hell. Doesn't she know that? And everybody just knew that this girl was going to hell because she left the Amish. She ran away with the, to the English. And if you're disobedient to the church, if you don't come to communion uh, and, 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 and agree with the rules and walk by them and you die, hell is for you. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be able to participate in communion, which means you have to be a member in good standing, which means you have to keep the rules. And that is why my mom would get so nervous and upset if she found out she was inadvertently breaking the rules because it could keep her from going to heaven. A porch swing could keep her from going to heaven. A pin in the wrong place could keep her from going to heaven. She wanted to go to heaven but her only peace was in trying to keep all the rules and being a member in good standing. No doubt in my mind that excommunication and shunning is the fabric that holds the culture together. Take that away and you don't have an Amish culture. Mm -hmm. It holds it together. It has held it together all these years. I've realized that much of the values that they hold on to today mm -hmm. come out of heavy persecution for generations. Mm -hmm. It made them a beautiful culture. But what has happened over the years is that as the outside world has progressed and got more involved in technology and cars and electricity and all of those things, they started to hold back. And they began to make these little mm -hmm. fences and before long, all these little man-made rules became the focus of what makes me right with God is when I follow the rules by the church that are man-made rather than the commandments of God. When I was Amish and I dated this girl in Davis County, one of, one of the issues I knew that's gonna be coming up and that is they had devotions, read the Bible every morning, the German Bible every morning. While I was there, I read it with them. I knew that's gonna be an issue with my people from where I come from, because we didn't do that. You know, it was dangerous in a, it was dangerous to, to get into deep, too deep with the Bible, is what we felt like. You know, if you get too deep into the Bible, you might not stay Amish, is what we were afraid of. After I left the Amish, I went back to my dad, and I, 
I ask him, how do you become a child of God? How do you become a child of God? And I was just very kindly knelt with one knee in front of dad and I gave him the German Bible. I wanted him to translate it for me to the German Bible. I said, how do you become a child of God? Well, he didn't even let, he didn't even read it. I just started him to read, let him read. He closed the Bible, he jerked it away and he turned away and he just sat like this, looked the other way. He would not, he would not. He was too scared that the Bible would convert his thinking. It'd be too dangerous, it's too dangerous. The Amish church service that we just saw is filled with scripture. The hymns that they sing are saturated with it, the prayers are full of it, and they actually read the Bible in the church service. Several years ago, one of my aunts wrote me a letter, and she was very frustrated because in her community, they had started really stressing that everyone needed to read the Bible only in German. At the same time, they had stopped teaching German in their schools. If the Amish church service is based on scripture, why wouldn't they want their children to read the Bible? What would actually happen if an Amish man started studying the Bible? What if he was an Amish minister? Join us next time for my parents' story.